here is familiar with this artist or this work. Considered the father of cubism, Pablo Picasso said, every act of creation is first of all an act of destruction. I'll repeat that. Every act of creation is first of all an act of destruction. I'd like you to think about what that might mean for you and hold on to it because we'll come back to it at the end. My name is Sarah Merritt and I would like to share with you my personal journey to define and create beauty by way of poetry, art, and dance. Through a weird and winding education and career path, I found my beauty by making it, and so can you. After developing early, by junior high, I noticed an incredible disparity in size between my left and right breasts. I wanted to cover up. I gained weight, I grew my hair out, I tried to hide behind oversized, dark clothing. I wanted nothing more than to become invisible at the same time that adolescent bodies were being put on display in locker rooms for the first time. It was very upsetting. I was confused about why I didn't physically fit into the magazine definition of beautiful when in my heart I felt like I was. I was overcome with intense anger and I became depressed. I think many of you can probably relate to that feeling. So I retreated into myself and started to explore the idea of symmetry by drawing lamps. A weird thing, I know, but these mirrored lines evolved into patterns and tessellations or patterns of patterns and then eventually morphed into organic asymmetrical shapes of writhing controlled color. This became my obsession. I was fortunate to have a super supportive family. Aren't we cute? That's me with a little helmet riding in the sidecar. My mom consistently told me I was beautiful and I did not believe her. I knew she meant it, but it wouldn't make a big difference until I became much older. She would buy post-surgical bras and foam pads to sew into my undergarments and swimsuits so that I could appear normal while waiting for my body to develop right. But it never did. Over the next six years, the disparity became more pronounced so that by the time I was a junior in high school, I was clinically depressed. With an awkwardly saggy double D right breast and a tiny left one barely enough to set into a bra. At the same time, my mom was diagnosed with Huntington's disease, a genetic degenerative disease characterized by uncontrollable movements, memory loss, dementia, and ultimately death. This graceful woman I had always known to personify beauty had lost control over her body as well. Anger swelled. Depression deepened, and I felt overwhelmingly hopeless. Anybody here ever have that feeling, especially in adolescence? It's pretty common. My pediatrician actually brought up surgery, a route I had never considered because of all my preconceptions about plastic surgery. She even wrote a letter to our insurance company arguing for surgery as medical necessity due to the depression, but it was dismissed. So, my parents said, fuck it, and paid out of pocket for a right breast mastopexy and lift and a left breast augmentation, a saline implant with a silicone shell. I told one friend and had surgery the summer before my senior year of high school. Since my dad was a teacher and my mom worked all day, he was the one who had to help me change my bandages. For something that could have been so awkward, he managed it with the utmost sensitivity, never once making me feel uncomfortable. He completed the task with the medical focus he had developed as an EMT and soccer coach, combined with the compassion and understanding of a dad. I could not have made that change without these two people, and I want to make that very clear. I then spent a year in physical therapy, 
because the implant had to be inserted beneath my left pectoral muscle. And I told anybody who asked where I was, what I was doing, that I had had surgery for an enlarged thymus gland, a real thing which did not need surgery, but which instead contributed to a lifetime of asthma. Yay. But after all of this effort, I was fixed, right? Well, like most things, it's complicated. I then had to contend with the fact that I had agreed to have synthetic materials inserted into my sliced up body in order to fit into a societal interpretation of beauty that I still did not share. Once again, I dove into art as a means of control and a way to search for beauty, that elusive thing. Like most angsty teens, I wrote poetry to regurgitate my inner turmoil, but it helped. It really did help. I won't be sharing any of it with you today, but let's just assume that it was all amazing. And then, at the suggestion of my mom, who was a belly dancing hippie in the 60s and 70s, I took a belly dance class. I joined a troupe, and I even wore my mom's costume. The drawing, the writing, and the dancing, maybe more than anything, helped alter my perception of my body. I had closed it off for so long that allowing it to move freely through space, the way ink flowed from my hands on paper, was a small but powerful feeling that only intensified the more I explored it. When I was 18, I designed a tattoo, a yin and yang of scorpions surrounding the Arabic word for beauty. I had intended for it to be inscribed onto my spine in an effort to mark my skin with my own art. Beauty on the inside, surrounded by the grotesque. And then I had my aha moment. As a college freshman studying art, a drawing professor asked for volunteers to model for an open art class, fully clothed. I thought, what the heck? I'd been practicing invisibility for nearly seven years, I can certainly sit still for 60 minutes. So I volunteered and was seated in the midst of an elaborate still life setup. Surrounded by swaths of folded cloth, tables and chairs, arranged fruit, stacked boxes, flowers, and all sorts of small miscellaneous items, I was just another object among them. Students could then draw, paint, sculpt, anything they wanted, and one student decided to paint me. After the hour, as I watched her add some finishing touches to her work, I was blown away. She had captured me masterfully, accurately. And for the first time, I saw myself as art. It was pretty cool. I ended up transferring to an East Coast school to create my own major, Art, Sexuality, and Aesthetic Perception to pursue these ideas. Over the next three years, I studied, danced, drew, modeled, nude this time for local schools, and I got to know my body. I sought out a tattoo artist who I could work with to together design two more scorpions, merging the beautiful and the repulsive with the four elements on my skin where they could remind me that there is always beauty in the grotesque and vice versa, and that the two are not mutually exclusive. Now, more than 15 years later, I understand that beauty is not within me or without, not really. It is an experience, highly personal and overwhelmingly fraught with all the grit and grime of human transformation. But my story is not unique. I know how difficult it can be to talk about something so personal, so literally naked, yet we consistently talk about other people's bodies, whether aiming to judge or not. How we view ours often keeps us from experiencing life in full and meaningful ways, yet it is the vessel through which we do just that. At a time when identity plays such a major role in the practice of being human, it is essential that we try to know ourselves and others. See yourself, oh, so 
speaking of the human experience, the Smithsonian Institution's Human Origins Initiative is a collection of historical research revealing that, among many other things, humanity's evolution is inseparable from artistic expression. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, we used natural pigments on cave walls to communicate through color. We buried our dead with symbolic objects and personal adornments, giving them an identity. 50,000 years ago, we used handmade objects and pictograms to reflect the world around us. And 8,000 years ago, we combined patterns and symbols to represent sounds and concepts, words. All of this 3,000 years before the first recorded civilization complete with sophisticated language, Mesopotamia. We made art to prove that we exist and to claim our identity. Without these forms of expression, the record of our existence would be lost. I believe the arts are necessary. And by finding your own form of artistic expression, you can find and make your beauty as well. See yourself through art. See yourself in art. See yourself as art. See yourself through art. See yourself in art. See yourself as art. And of course, there's more data to support these experiences. Eric Jensen, one of the leading translators in the world of neuroscience into education, wrote a book called Arts with the Brain in Mind, in which he supports arts education as fundamental. Much of his information comes from five different university studies that looked into the effects of art on the brain and revealed that arts education physically changes the structure and size of our brain. It makes it bigger. So he said, the systems the arts nourish, which include our integrated sensory, attentional, cognitive, emotional, and motor capacities, are in fact the driving forces behind all other learning. We need art first. How many of you here are familiar with art therapy or other forms of expressive therapy like music or dance? Excellent. In 2016, folks at Drexel University looked into the emotional success of art therapy, like, how does this thing work? Is it real? By providing free art-making experiences to individuals, some with art backgrounds and some without, participants re sub, uh, reported significantly lower negative feelings, higher positive feelings, and greater self-efficacy, regardless of background. Overall, just 45 minutes of art making improved not only individuals' current self-confidence, but their confidence that they would succeed in future endeavors. By making art, we believe we can do anything. So we've talked a little bit about the brain. Let's bring it back to the body. Many of you already know that inflammation can be a major contributor to poor health by leading to heart disease, diabetes, low immune response, chronic pain, and other conditions. Well, a 2018 UC Berkeley study questioned the physiological effects of awe-inspiring experiences, those things that make us go, wow. And they ended up connecting our emotions to our physical health as well. There are many different types of awe, but overall, participants who experienced more awe-struck moments had the lowest levels of interleukin-6, which is a marker of inflammation. What that means is that what we do to experience awe, walking in nature, listening to music, beholding art, having beautiful experiences makes us happier and healthier. So, I invite you to take a class, model for an artist, Write and record your innermost thoughts. Visit museums, galleries, or even just coffee shops to look at art. Listen to art. Move through art. Think about art. Draw your own lamps and begin to find your own form of artistic expression. Begin to view yourself as a living subject full of beauty. 
I have been teaching since I was 15. I currently teach art, dance, and other forms of creative expression every chance I get. And I think about Picasso's words. Every act of creation is, first of all, an act of destruction. I teach by breaking the whole down into the sum of its parts. Lines, angles, forms, shapes, movements, colors, textures. And refiguring those parts to build a new, complete whole. My greatest joy is seeing worlds open up when people find a new way to express. Especially if they, if you, have something to overcome. Struggles with mental health, self-esteem, body image, powerlessness, physical or other limitations, or even just shyness. Opening up a path through artistic expression can give rise to extraordinary change for good. Now go find your beauty. Thank you.